the consent agenda. The items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so requests. The items on this evening's consent agenda are as follows. Item A, approve agenda as submitted. Item B, receive and place on file all notices pertaining to this meeting. Item C, receive and place on file all materials having any bearing on this meeting. Item D, approval of minutes of regular meeting on November 3rd, 2014 as on file in the City Clerk's Office. Item E, approval of Treasurer's Report of Claims, the amount of $184,684.95. Item F, approval of Boswell Report of Claims, the amount of $10,946.28. Item G, approval of Change Order Number 2, increase in the amount of $64,769.91 for a total contract price of $1,291,125.11. To Elkhorn West Construction for the Library Renovation Project. Item H, approval of change order number one, a decrease in the amount of $2,220 for a total contract price of $85,005. To Midland Contracting Incorporated for the Sanitary Sewer Lining Project 2014. Item I, resolution number 5700, executing the renewal of maintenance agreement number four with the Nebraska Department of Roads. Item J, resolution number 5701, entering into a farm lease with Justin Wiegand for property adjacent to the landfill. Item K, resolution number 5702, entering into an agreement with Oslin and Associates for services for the water main crossing replacement across the Big Blue River at Highway 77. Item L, resolution number 5703, prohibiting parking along the east side of South 9th Street from Green Street to Nichols and allowing parking along the west side of South 9th Street from Green to Nichols. Item M, approval of manager application of Mary A. Walters in connection with the American Legion Post, number 27 <coughs> liquor license. And item N, refer claim of Brandon and Regina Harris regarding their dog, Bo, that was euthanized on November 4th, 2014. Those are the items on the consent agenda. First, does anyone on the council wish to have an item removed for individual discussion? Rich. G. G. Anyone else on the council? L, as in lucky. Okay. Anyone else in the council? Anyone in the audience? Anyone, we have a motion. Mayor, I move that all the items listed on the consent agenda, with the exception of items G and L, be approved, accepted, and or ratified as presented. Second. Moved by Catlin, seconded by Cook, that the items listed on the consent agenda, with the exceptions of items G and L, be approved, accepted, and or ratified as presented. Discussion on that motion. And your vote, please. Motion carries 8-0. We'll go back to item G. If we could have a motion on the floor, please. Mayor, I move the approval of change order number two increase in the amount of $64,769.91 for a total contract price of $1,291,125.11 to Elkhorn West Construction for the library renovation project be approved, accepted, and ratified as presented. Second. Moved by Cat <coughs> excuse me, Catlin, seconded by Kerr to approve change order number two. Increase in the amount of $64,769.91 for a total contract price of $1,291,125.11 to Elkhorn West Construction for the Library Renovation Project. And Rich, you have the floor. The only, the only <coughs> thing, I've had two or three phone calls on this uh, want to know where we're getting the money. I've explained to them that this is from the library board fund. Could you just, uh, that this has nothing to do with the tax dollars, that the money is there, and, and <coughs> could you just tell them where they got the money and assure them that it is not coming out of taxpayers' money that... that sure. Uh, n the funds for this project are coming from the library foundation. It's funds that they have received over the years through gifts or wills or bequests, things like that. Uh, that's where they have received their funding over the years. And most of this change order has to do with fire marshal and what they are requiring to be done with the building. So that's where the money's coming from and that's what's the bulk of this change order. That's all I, I just wanted it put out there that, that that's where the money was coming from. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be some kind of misconception on that, so. I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion from council members? How about the audience, anyone? 
not you vote please motion carries eight zero now if we could return back to item l and have a motion on the floor mayor i move that resolution number 5703 prohibiting <coughs> parking along the east side of south ninth street from green to nichols and allowing parking along the west side of south ninth street from green to nichols be approved accepted and ratified as presented second moved by catlin second by claybaugh to approve resolution number 5703 prohibiting parking along the east side of south 9th street from green to nichols and allowing parking along the west side of south 9th street from green to nichols ted you have the floor I, you know i don't really have a huge problem <coughs> i guess i had a little bit of question i there's a sl there's a small map in here um the, it doesn't give it gives me the distance you want to swap the parking but it didn't give me the the width of any of the streets and and i don't have a big deal it's not a huge deal with if you're putting it back on green street because i understand why it was off before and you have less structures there you have less people that are working in the area now but and i and i and i did get the whole premise that people live on one side and you don't have any buildings on the other side and you want to change it but if you're going to put it back onto green street and from my from just what I can recall from driving it, Green Street's just as wide as 9th Street, isn't it? So if it's okay to park on there, why isn't it okay to park on 9th? Well, we are gonna allow parking on 9th Street. It's currently allowed on the east side of the road. Correct, but you're putting, putting it back off on the both, east. You're putting it back on both sides of Green. We're gonna take it off the east side of 9th and we're gonna put it on the west side of 9th Correct. between Green and Nichols. Right. So there's no, this doesn't have anything to do with parking on Green Street. Okay, I misread it and I looked at the map and, and I, I believe the road is 26 feet wide, if I'm not mistaken. It's not wide enough to put two lanes of parking and somebody to get and traffic to flow through. Okay. So that's why we allow parking on one side. Yeah. And it came at the request of one of the uh, residents. Up yeah, there. I, and I understand it. I mean, I understand that you know the manor was there, the Good Sam was there, and they torn down the building. And of course, we're going to probably have to address it if something gets built on the other side. Or, but now, yeah, other than that, I, I didn't have a problem. I. Just, as I read this thing, I, I must have just not got through it thoroughly enough. <coughs> it's on me. I don't have any problem with it. Thanks. Thanks. Any additional council discussion about the audience? Can you vote, please? And motion carries 8-0. Resolution 5703 has been passed and adopted. Next, we'll hold a public hearing on the semi-annual report of the Citizens Advisory Review Committee for as provided by LB840, and I'll welcome Grant Jones to uh, give the committee's report. Good evening. Uh, to date, we have not had much activity from the last uh, report we gave you. We know of some applications that are forthcoming, uh, and we will certainly review those and make recommendations as uh, required once we get them. Uh, up to this point, though, since the last meeting, we have not had any new applications. So at this point, we have in the LB840 funds $1,126,989 and some change. And with the CDBG money, we have just a shade under $100,000 at 93466 and some change. With that, I honestly don't have a whole lot to report at this point. Uh, most of the loans are okay uh, to date. We expect that that will change here in the next month, of course. Um, canned hams, I believe, is still playing a little catch up, but they are making payments. And uh, the loan made out to Heartland Glass that are current every month. So that's kind of where we're at up, up to date. Okay, does anyone have questions for Grant? Okay, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak in the LB840 hearing? Okay. Nothing else to add. I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Mayor, I move that the public hearing be closed at 7.12 p.m. Second. Moved by Callan, second by Morgan to close the public hearing at 7.12 p.m. Discussion on that motion from the council, from the audience. Any vote, please. Uh, if, why don't you hold it to the public forum, if you would, please. Okay, thanks, Grant. Thank you. Okay, next to introduce resolution number 5704, entering into two contracts with Landis and Gear Technology, a master purchase and services agreement, and a command center 
manage services package to implement an automatic meter infrastructure system as recommended by the Board of Public Works. And I move that resolution number 5704 be passed and adopted. Second. Moved by Catlin, seconded by party that resolution number 5704 be passed and adopted. Are you doing the Board of Public Works tonight? I, I will. Uh, as you saw in your packet, the Board of Public Works met on Wednesday and they recommended approval of entering into this agreement. And uh, Pat Feist and Steve Kelly are here to answer questions as well as we talk about this. Uh, first thing I just want to talk to you about the history, how we got here. Uh, if you remember back when we did our budget in 2013, we started budgeting for this program. Uh, so we budgeted funds last fiscal year, this fiscal year, and for the next couple fiscal years to pay for this. Um, in 2013, we hired Olson Associates to help us write an RFP to go out and start looking at different companies. Uh, in February of this year, we received five responses, and we evaluated those five responses. We narrowed that list down to two, and from there, we went out, uh, Pat and Steve and I, we went out and visited uh, this different locations where they had these uh, programs in, in effect and running. Um, we did those site visits in June. I know Pat did a couple additional site visits in Kansas, I believe in probably July or so, somewhere in that neighborhood is when he went down there. And then in August, we started negotiating a contract with these people. Uh, and our recommendation is obviously Lance and Gear, as you see in the contract here before you. And I think probably the biggest thing to talk about is, uh, probably one of the questions you have is why? Well, what are the benefits? What are we gonna get from this? And um, the one that's probably the largest for us is the uh, outage management. Uh, what this system will allow us to do is if we have a storm, say like we did last June, uh, this would allow uh, the lecture department to be able to pull up and see which meters are out of power, which ones are not, so they know that helps them analyze where the problems are coming from, where they need to go make the repairs, then they're able to make those and be able to tell which meters come back on. So they know if they missed a meter someplace, if some place is still out of power. Um, Pat could probably tell you that last June, one of the issues they had was the storm came at night, and so we put power back on the people. They're trying to find out if houses had power or didn't have power, and it's kind of hard to do at night when lights weren't on and, and trying to tell if, you know, if they need to go back. The last thing we do is roll a truck back to a, a location to try to hook something back up. Um, other benefits include just the data we are able to receive from the system. Um, we'll be able to get information from meters if they're getting too much voltage, not enough voltage if it's changing throughout the day, which lets us know if there's a problem on down the line. Uh, we'll get information about our substations if they're having issues. Uh, let us know before we have a problem, we'll be able to go out and fix them. Uh, sometimes we have meters that disappear. Uh, this would tell us as soon as that meter is pulled, we'll get a report that says that that meter is now missing. Um, so we know immediately. We then know if that meter gets plugged back in someplace else. Uh, we'll get that notification that the meter will tell us it's in the wrong location. And it does happen more than you think. Um, it will allow us to do automatic meter reading. I mean, that is one of the benefits of this system. Uh, we'll be able to read all the, the meters electronically. Um, one place that helps us is right now if somebody moves out, we have to send somebody out to go read that meter. And then when somebody moves in, we have to go back out and hook that meter back up. And so we end up rolling trucks a couple times to go out and do those. With this system, we won't have to do that anymore. Uh, obviously, if um, um, there's also the automatic disconnect and reconnect, that's another benefit that we have. Uh, again, if, if your power is disconnected either during office hours or after office hours, we have to roll a truck and a, and a person out to that location to hook you, to disconnect you or reconnect you. Those cost us money. Uh, the reconnections after hours, we do charge for those but we don't charge enough to recoup our cost in just the salary alone that we charge, not including the, the equipment time. Uh, this will allow us to, to do those as well. Um, I get that. I would leave it open for questions that you guys have about the system or? You know, Pat and uh, Steve, I just want to come up here in case we need you to. And we'll get to you in just a little bit here. We'll start with the council as tradition. Council discussion items? Well, I, I think if you if you look at it just by uh, how long it's going to take to pay this back, I spoke with Pat this morning, and uh, it 12, 14 years or something like that. But the intangibles that we talked about make this more worth it. So would you would you talk about some of the other things that that uh, would 
benefit because if you just look at this, from what I understand, it used to be like five million when this first started, and it's down to 1.9 million now, uh, which still is a lot of money. It's going to take a long time to and it is recoup and that. This morning when you talked to me, Rick, um, <coughs> I was out in my truck, so I didn't have a lot of information with me. Um, but we talked about some of the savings. One of the savings that we'll be able to do with this that's actually a we'll be able to see monthly is um, right now we control voltage uh, on our distribution system at our peak times. Uh, the lower that we can bring our peak power down, uh, the less demand charges we get from our power supplier. Um, we've, we've been running some tests. Um, they're not very efficient right now because we don't know what our voltage at the end of the line is. We don't want to lower that too much to where we're causing problems for people, but we've been able to, in our limited capacity without the information, we've been able to lower our um, peak demands about one and a half megawatts, which correlates to about seventeen to eighteen thousand dollars a month off of our um, power bill. So that's an additional savings that I didn't mention to you this morning um, on our brief conversation. But that's one of the things we can do with it. Um, there's some distribution automation, which um, is automatic switching. Um, there's uh, switches that we can have out on our distribution lines um, that we would be able to control from our service center, um, which would aid us, uh, additionally aid in um, outage problems um, or isolating sections of line in case of an emergency um, accidents, things that happen when power poles are hit. Um, so there's there's things there's things in that nature that, that we'll be able to do that will um, be able to make things a lot more efficient. Um, things happen a lot quicker. Um, Tobias has touched on the the um, the assistance with outage management when we do have a large storm or even small outage. If we get one or two calls, um, the first thing the guy that the on call guy would do would come in, pull the computer up, and make sure he knows exactly where he's going and, and how many houses he needs to to double check on when he's when he believes he's done. So that there's a lot of advantage to that. Um, can I put a dollar amount to those individual things? Uh, some of them I can't. The, the voltage control I can, and we believe we can get more savings out of that when, we, when we're able to get our end of the line information back to us. Um, but Tobias has touched on a lot of it. There's, um, there's some things that could come down the road possibly with uh, different billing. Uh, structures. Um, right now, um, uh, you get charged one as a res as a residence or a business. There's one cost uh, regardless of the time of day. Um, there's been some discussion at the federal level that they could force us to go to time use to try to get people to be more efficient during the day. If that would happen, these meters will be set up for that. These meters are capable of doing time of use metering. So we're not looking at doing that right now. Um, but it could be something we're forced into down the road. Uh, so we're trying to be a little proactive on getting some of this stuff installed if those regulations do come through. Um, it will also allow us to read water meters. Um, Steve can get information from those. Um, the, the biggest thing initially is going to be able to be to get our um, load data for billing um, to be able to do disconnects, reconnects without rolling trucks and, and people all the time. Um, and then with our with our load management efforts, trying to reduce our, our demand charges, that's going to be, I believe that's going to be a big thing, especially with the voltage control. How about with you, Steve? <clears throat> well, on the water side, basically, you know, where, where it's not nearly as sophisticated as what the electric is, but it does allow us to get uh, uh, with the right type of meters, which we're been installing for the last three years, uh, the data from them, we can get um, low flow, um, high flow, average flow for each hour for up to 30 days. And quite honestly, right now i got to go out and download that with my laptop. But that does come in handy. People say, well, we couldn't, there's no way we can use that much water. Uh, you pull that information up, okay, you have, you have a constant flow. Usually at midnight, the flows should be pretty close to zero. But if you got a cost of flow from midnight till five in the morning, uh, you got something leaking. And we, we've actually gone in and found uh, leaks in 
in people's homes because of that already. You know, it could be a toilet, it could be a water softener, things like that. So there are some advantages, but the main thing for me is uh, we won't have to, you know, the automatic meter reading comes in. Um, they guaranteed <coughs> that we would get 98.5% of the reads within 24 hours. So basically we read the whole majority of the town in 24 hour period. And um, it just be a, yeah, just uh, a savings, you know, as far as uh, having personnel walking around throughout the community 30 days, four weeks a month, you know. Okay. Um, quick question. We said the uh, payback period was estimated at what on this? Um, just, with, just with meter reading and um, on that end of it, um, we figured 10 to 12 years possibly. 10 to 12 years. That's and what we're looking at. I think it's going to be better than that with our with our um, energy management. Um, once we get all the meters installed, that we'll be able to, to uh, assist us with reducing our our peak load demands. What's what's the uh, practical economic life of a meter, both electric and water? Um, on the the new electronic ones, um, probably 25 to 30 years on the electric side. Water water is guaranteed 20 years. Uh, the radio units guaranteed 20. The meters we actually have in place today are capable of uh, handling the radio. So we can, even though we don't have a meter that has the data available, uh, which we're upgrading those meters uh, for the last three years, the existing meters, we can put the radio on there and, and read them. Um, the new meters are guaranteed, the battery life on them is estimated at 20 years, and the radios are estimated also at 20 years. Okay, and the um, radio infrastructure, antennas, I assume you have some repeaters and things that get, get the signal back to you, that's going to last how long? Um, they're, 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 they're saying 20 years right now. Okay. Now, uh, I'm not an expert on that side of it, so I, I'll take their word for that. Um, they have given us some pretty, some pretty substantial guarantees on the equipment, so okay. we feel pretty comfortable with that. Okay, uh, Bob. Um, I look at the fee structure for the software and those type of things on a monthly basis, ongoing basis. Does that include things like upgrades, upgrade support, yes. and did they give you an idea of what? an average percentage increase might typically be? I mean, there's and, and is there any other additional maintenance fees on that software? I don't recall additional up, or additional fees, you mean, as far as a yearly increase? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't recall that, that they had anything in there as what that they were looking at okay. um, over the next five years. Um, but what that includes is they will store all of our data at their data center. Um, they've got a location in Kansas City. And they also will manage and control the software program, which includes all the updates. Um, basically, all we'll have a portal into it to where we can get into it. And if we want to look at meters, or you know, if we're troubleshooting something, or if we need to get our billing data, <coughs> they provide the billing information to us uh, whenever we request it. Um, but all the upgrades, all the man software management is done on their side. That's included with that monthly fee. Okay. So basically it's a cloud solution where yes. it's not residing here. And, and the reason we went, we're initially doing that um, is just to avoid the, the cost of the servers um, and the personnel to run it in-house. Um, down the road, if we decided it's going to be a better, better setup for us to have it on site, we, we can go that way. But the people that I've talked to that have this system up and running, um, they all say that the best thing they did was to have it hosted. So and, and that's becoming kind of a common solution a for, standard. For, for a lot of different softwares now is, is that cloud-based software. Yeah, and the, just, just not having the extra hardware, the extra servers that, right. that you would have to have to support this system um, offsets that cost very did, did they talk about uptime or any type of redundancy for their servers in case things went haywire on their end? They have mul they have another location. Uh, it'll be backed up off-site of their data center in Kansas City. So there's the, there's a, a minimum of two locations that our data will be housed at. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rich. Um, this started before I got back on, and, and, and I'm not 
you will go to each house in, in Beatrice and put on a new electric meter and a new water meter. Is, is that correct? It will be a new electric meter. The water meter will just be a radio. And we're upgrading, our, like I mentioned earlier, we're upgrading our, radio, our other meters as we speak. And eventually, within the uh, next 10 years, so all of them should be replaced. But initially, we'll just put a radio on, on, the, on the old uh, water meters. Okay. And uh, then that, that, that's the truck just drives by and, you know. No, no. Uh, this is. We'll, this we'll, will go we'll into your. a communication your... system in town. It's an RFI uh, mesh system. Is what they what they call it. So there'll be there'll be two base radios and a few repeaters or routers, I guess is what they call them. Um, so this will be a radio read, a true radio read system. We won't have to drive, you know, roll a truck around to read meters or anything. Good. Um, so then, if we okay this, we should uh, probably let the community know that we're going to have to come in and. It, the, the the electric meter that you have now is that just unplug and this new meter yes. will plug in, yes. so it, it won't be any inconvenience to the okay. The, the biggest inconvenience is they'll be out of power for 30 to 45 seconds while we pull the old meter and, and plug the new one in. Okay, just just okay, fine. Thank you. I just didn't know how it worked, guys. So. No, no problem. Okay. What's the? Uh, we've had one meter reader uh, retire. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the plan for the remainder? Uh, we have two additional ones. Uh, at this time, uh, as I stated in my memo, I, I think you'll see those two positions probably be fully eliminated within the next three years as you implement this system. Now, you may very well <coughs> need to have one staff person just go out and service these meters. That may be a possibility, and we don't know that yet. Um, but those other two positions will be eliminated. If they can be absorbed into, if we can reassign those individuals to other places within the city, you know, we may look to do that as other openings become available. Um, but it will obviously depend on their abilities and what positions we have open. Okay. Dwight. I'm assuming you're not going to request additional staffing to monitor any of this. Is that correct? We're not. The, the communities that I've met with, um, they have not needed any additional staffing. Um, the only there was one that did require additional staffing, but they're hosting or they're doing all the software and data on site. The other four communities that I looked at are all hosting it, and they did not require any additional staffing to, to monitor the system or manage. And is this something that all of your employees can go in and figure out if there's a leak on a weekend or evening or, or power loss, whatever? Yep, they will all be trained to. Uh, I mean, basically, they'll walk into the shop and they'll there'll be a computer set in there. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll start it up. Um, go right into the program and it'll show them it'll it's set up so that it'll bring them right to the area of town where there's an outage as far as on the electric side and show them which meters and which addresses are without power so yeah the, the guys will be trained in that so they will be able to to utilize that information Ted you done then? yep well, I've been trying to jot myself some notes um, as you've been giving the little presentation so so kind of bear with me if you, because most of it you've answered or covered. Um, the monitoring system, the 24 hours a day, Pat, um, and you said you, they can still bring it up, but someone still has to call and tell you there's an outage for someone to come up. I mean, is there some kind of an alarm system? Do you have yeah. somebody? If, if a meter loses power, if electric meter loses okay. power, it sends out what they call a last gasp or a warning okay. that says, I lost power. Now, we can set that up. Um, to actually call our guys out, send text messages, send emails. Um, it can actually send a voice uh, um, call, a pre-recorded call to that to the on-call guy saying, um, or however many guys you want it to send it to, that there's an issue. Okay. Well, that. So I mean, so I think in answer to your question, yeah, we we know we'll know immediately if there's if it's during the day. <clears throat> Um, there'll be a monitor in our secretary's right. office. Right. She'll have an alarm right away. If it's after hours, um, our on-call phones will be programmed in, and they will send messages to those. Yeah, because th the question I had, I didn't see the the efficiency of it, I guess. If, if I had an outage at my house and I still had to make that phone call and your person still had to get in his, the on-call call person still had to go get in his vehicle, go to the center, to you know, pull up the computer and said, "Yeah, yeah, he's right. He's he's out." Yeah. Well, it, <coughs> if it happens after you get home from work or on a weekend, okay, you're, I'm sure you're still gonna. The people are still gonna call. They lose power. They're gonna call right away. Right. Um, 
we will still be notified immediately also from our system. Um, after hours, yes, the guys have to, they'll have, they'll have to go out and get a truck. And right. um, the biggest thing that they'll be able to look at, they'll be able to pull the computer up and they'll say, okay, this is just Ted's house. It's just his service or something like that. Or we have 10 people out in that area. It's a larger problem. Yeah, in the past when I've called about a power outage, and whoever I've spoke to, you know, at, at night, they'll ask me, can you look out and see if your neighbors have power? So that eliminates this. Well, yeah, we'll, you know, by the time the guys get to the shop, the, the outage report will be populated with all the, the addresses that are out of power. So okay. they'll know that, and they'll know whether it's something they can handle if they need additional help. Or... Okay. Um, the voltage control savings... Voltage control savings thing that you talked about, I don't really understand how that works. When, and that's over our distribution system. Okay. We have several different things that we utilize to help um, manage our peak usage times. Because um, our, our electric bill is uh, phased on two things. It's on demand, which is our peak usage, and on kilowatt hour, total kilowatt hours used. Um, so what we try to do in the summertime and in the wintertime is our, our peak demand we try to reduce as much as possible because we pay um, between 13 and 13 and a half dollars per kilowatt hour that the per, per kW that's that's used. Um, this past summer and this fall um, we feel just by lowering our distribution voltage we've been able to save about a megawatt and a half which is 1500 I mean times your times your demand charge. So we're paying at a di we're paying a different rate at peak usage than we are no, it's our peak usage. I know you're struggling to explain this well, to somebody that's not terribly bright. So the way the way MPPD looks at it, our, our uh, I'll just take August. Okay. They they look at our every hour that they sell us power, and whichever is the highest hour. Uh, in August we had a. Our highest bill, our highest demand was 36, I'd be 36.4 megawatts. So that's what we paid, our, that, that's what they base our demand charges Okay. On. So if we can take that 36.4 and drop it down to 35 or 34, okay. um, it's, if you can drop it down to 35, it's 1,400 times our $13 charge. Right. So it, it, it adds up very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Now I do understand it. Okay. So I'm sure I could have asked anybody else in the council that would have been to explain that to me. Um, <laughs> You, you talked about displacing the employee that you guys touched on that a little bit. Um, you don't see any immediate plan to cut somebody loose. You don't, you don't see immediate, I know you had somebody retire. So you're, you're talking about just through attrition. We have not, we have not replaced that gentleman. And I believe the plan is to plans not to replace that position. And I don't think it'll happen through attrition, uh, because Year one, we're going to put in the communication system in 1,000 meters. We okay. still have to go out and read all the other meters in town, the other roughly 4,000 meters. Okay. Year two, you put in some more meters, but year three, you've, put, you've finished putting all the meters in. So until they're all complete, you're still going to have to have somebody go out and read some meters. Okay. Well, that, I have that as a question. You touched on the servicing the meters. Mm -hmm. Is this a different level of expertise to service these types of meters, both what Steve has and what you have? There will be some additional training for, I mean, we have several technicians on staff in the electric department now that okay. do all of our metering, meter testing. Um, our test equipment that works on the old style meter, meters will still work on the new ones. Uh, we can test them for accuracy if there's a question on that. Um, we can, we'll be able to test the communication module in it uh, if there's, for some reason, we stop communicating with a certain meter. Um, all that training is included with this uh, package price. Okay. The off-site system, the off-site, so basically yeah, the, the brains of it. Sure. Okay. So is there anything that, is there, is there any way that there's a manual override or something? I mean, off-site works really well as long as that site's still working. <coughs> I mean, do we have, are you, are you completely reliant on the off-site? Well, um, as Bob had asked, they, they, have, they back all their stuff up to another site. And right. And are you asking a separate question than that? No, part? no, I, I, I get that. But um, if you have a failure off-site, and I understand that they have, because our computer system, work, right. you know, we have 
One's in Atlanta, one's in Paramus, New Jersey. Okay. So, but my question is, is that if you have a failure off-site, if there's a critical failure off-site, do you still have some type of way to manually manipulate it from this locale? Or do you know? We, we would not. The way that it's going to be set up, the way that's being set up, um, from my understanding on the data centers, though, that they have so much redundancy with mm -hmm. the number of servers that they have. Um, if I believe a catastrophic would probably have to be a tornado or something that takes yeah. the whole building out. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, if they lose one server, everything's redundant enough that it it switches over and you're still up and running. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but. <coughs> well, that's the information I've been giving. I think that's all I got right now. Okay, I can jump in here again. You no, know, it's my last <coughs> meeting. I can, get, I can do that. I'll defer. I'll get to you, fellas, here just a little bit. Uh, how prevalent is this technology in the uh, in a region? How many utilities uh, have that? Uh, Norris, Nebraska Public Power, any of the locals um, around? I know Norris is looking at it. Um, I don't know how in-depth they are at this same system. Um, Grand Island is installing the same system we're looking at. Sydney, Nebraska is installing the same system. Um, the two places that I, I looked at in Kansas were um, Dodge City and Liberal. Um, they're both fully deployed. Um, they have been. Dodge City has been fully deployed for several years. Um, Minden I, has another, not, not the meters that we're using, not the same company, but Minden has another similar system right. with a different company. And South I, Sioux City, were they another one? South Sioux City has another one. It's, it's, it's not the same company we're looking at, but, and I, but I do know the company that we're looking at has, um, when I met with them last, they had nine systems going in in their area, which is um, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa. So, and if you want locally, Auburn has an older version of the system. It's, it doesn't have all the things that we can do with ours, but they have an older version that they put in a oh, number of years ago. Any, any of them talk to you about their, their payback period? Is, does it get shorter with the, the larger utility? That, the only one that would talk to me about it was Liberal, and they said their payback is, has been faster than what they anticipated. But they didn't quantify They didn't go into details on it. They they a larger utility or smaller than us? Um, actually, their their city's about the same size as Beatrice, a little bit smaller, but they have a lot of rural and a lot of small towns okay. around there. So their the actual population that they're serving is larger than Beatrice. Okay, so well, you're you're out ten to twelve years to break even, which you know in in the business world puts you out there a ways. Do you have any other projects with a quicker payback that you can think of doing right now, or is this the project that's that's out there? Asking for your qualitative judgment on it. Not that I'm aware of right now. Not that we've looked into. Okay. Um, there's, I mean, we're always looking at things to improve the system with short pay, as short as payback as possible. Um, we try to do our due diligence and not <coughs> jump into anything lightly. So we, this this particular system here, this uh, the AMI system, we've looked at probably three times over the last eight years. <coughs> uh, the initial time costs were over twice as high and it was a f extremely new new technology um, was something we wanted to jump into and we feel it, we feel it's the right time for us now okay all right we'll go down the line first rich mine was answered uh, okay. with Ted's Rick well, I was just wondering the the 15,000 a year support is I was trying to look through here is that <coughs> 15,000 for the eternity here it d didn't look like there was a certain number of years that it was going to be is that clarified I didn't see it anywhere in here I don't know that it's it's set out how much it'll be every year thereafter uh, that has to do with how many endpoints you have yeah, so if we add other yeah, additional that meters that price goes up um, but I believe that the hosting number was uh, fairly constant I mean I'm sure that it has some escalators in there but within the, the, the initial big, term the biggest thing they told me that would would uh, change that number was if we started adding a lot of endpoints, which an endpoint is an electric <coughs> meter, a water meter, or um, a piece of equipment, one of our substations that we would communicate with and store data on. They said that would be the biggest thing that would um, 
Now, I believe the number we have is good through the three-year installation period that we wouldn't see any escalation in that time frame. <clears throat> if I remember, I was nine cents a per import after that. So if you had water and electric, you're talking 18 cents a residence. Yeah, if yeah. That's, that's what they gave us if we were adding additional endpoints was nine cents per endpoint. Okay, Bob. Just probably a strange question, but since it's, a, since the company's somewhat progressive, do they talk a little bit about whether they're going to have application or whether it can be accessed also on your tablet? I the thing that got, or can you put it on more than one computer? What I got to thinking about was, you know, you um, could have a power outage out at the shop. Right. Is it going to be someplace else, or is it something that pretty it's soon will be on a phone that, or a yeah. tablet? Um, it can be installed on. I know laptops for sure. Okay. Um, there's there's no limit on the number of people in our organization that will have access to this. We, if we want every single person to have access to it, that can be set up. Um, it's a password, login right. name, and password. So in theory, they can access it anywhere. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's so a web based. I can, I can access it from yeah. home if I need to. Um, I can log in from home and, and access it from there. Okay, Ted. Um, for us, for both of you, I guess. Does this? Although you're you're at the end point where you where you're controlling the where you're gathering the data from usage, but does this give you Steve? Does this give you data on flow through of any, any of your water lines or your lift stations? And Pat, does this give you any indication from your different um, substations power usage in a particular point? I mean, is it system wide or is it just user wide? Yeah. On the electric side, it can be system-wide. Um, we're starting with um, the metering because we need that endpoint data for everything back to the substation. Okay. Um, we currently do read our subs remotely, so we get those that info. We, we get so that's that. being done. That's being done right now. Um, if we once we get this first stage done, if we decide we want everything incorporated into this, same you can system, integrate it into this. We can integrate it into this. Okay. It's not something we have to do, it's, but it's an option that's out there if we decide that's the best way for us to go down the road. Okay. And on the water side, we're using a SCADA system at the present time, um, which basically I can access from any, anywhere I can get internet, <coughs> even on my phone. And I can turn on and off wells and set the levels when the tank fills and things like that. If I can get some information through this reading system if I put the radios on those on those meters, but basically all I'm going to get is flow. Yeah, I, if on the water side of it, I just wondered if you could monitor lift station if it was failing, so you could, or if it was increased usage, so you could say, you know, so you could read historical data over a year or two years or three year period of time. Is is it working in at, at the at a given level or? Is, I just wondered the amount of information that you could get uh, off the system uh, wide. The, the lift stations basically are all on the on the wastewater side. <clears throat> I don't have any. You know, we have the high service pumps at uh, Fourth and Grant, uh -huh. that, and then there's uh, six pumps there we control with our SCADA system this time. If I this reading system basically the only advantage would be it would give me the readings off each pump. That's okay. if I if I put a radio on that meter. So. All right. The, actually, the water side's pretty simple. We're just kind of tagging along with the, the electric. But there are some advantages, you know, the, of the data I can get, you know, uh, on time of use for each hour for, you know, for 30 days. And, you know, even reverse flow, if somebody would have them take the meter out, turn around backwards, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a signal on that. Um, if somebody just takes a meter out and puts a nipple on there, I'm going to get a signal for that. So there are some advantages. Does it happen often? Probably not, but we really don't know at this time. Right. Okay. Council, uh, Phil. Right. One more uh, on work, network design and general services. So, was as I was reading through this, you are responsible for new poles and things. Is this going to be a large expense, or can we use our existing poles? It's asking for fiber. I was just wondering, how the, is that all going to? There might have to be a few poles changed um, just to get some additional height. We have those at our certain. I mean, we're looking at using wood poles, okay. so we have those in stock. Um, we don't see a lot of that that needs to be done um, from their initial reports to us. Um, so 
there shouldn't be a lot of extra expense on our side for that. Well, I was reading through that. I thought, wow, I have to put 45 put, foot poles all over the place and I have to do this. I thought, well, and, and we're looking at um, two main radio units and if I remember, eight, eight to nine collectors or routers, I'm sorry. So there, there's, there's not a huge amount of um, infrastructure that's going up. So it wouldn't, even if we had to change a few poles, it wouldn't be that many. Okay. The only requirement on the water side is that there's got to be, uh, I believe, an electric meter within a thousand foot because the electric meter actually sends the signal to the water meter and the <coughs> water meter transmits back to the electric meter and then to the router. A further council discussion. We haven't had a chance for the audience yet. So I'll go out to the audience. Any, anyone like to discuss this issue, please come forward. You guys can stay there. Okay, back to the council. Any further discussion? There's not. And I'll ask for your vote. Oh, no, well, there is. I, I guess the, if you want to go for further discussion, I'm just not ready to vote on this. Okay. I, I, I. Obviously, the Board of Public Works. I'm assuming you know through the and I know that we've discussed we, the discussion of this began a couple of years ago, and and I would and I was as I read I tried I tried to go back through the Board of Public Works meetings, minute meetings, and I, I didn't really see where they had a lot of discussion on this. Um, so I, I understand that it's a cumulative effort. But um, the first time I knew I was going to vote on this was on Saturday when I read the paper. And, uh, and I got this information and I've talked to you guys tonight, but I'm not really, I'm, maybe it'll take me a week or two to have it all soak in and maybe I'll have some more questions. But I, I'm, just not, I'm just not ready to spend $2 million on 40 minutes of discussion. And so I suggest I, what you do is make a motion to postpone action until the next meeting. Well, that's I. I think it's that's fair. I mean, it is a lot of money. Right. And, well, the thing of it is, and I, I, that's what I was trying to broach with the rest of the councilmen. If I, I I'm not looking for a straw poll here, but I, I was trying to look for. I'm not. I'm not. Not. I don't want to vote against it because it, it may be a good program, but I don't want to vote. For it because I'm not ready to vote for it, and if the majority of the council feels the same way, then I'll make that motion and we'll and we'll do that. But if, throw if everybody out, throw it out on the floor and see if it flies, I don't know when the next meeting is, Dennis. It'll be December first. Um, that's imagine how you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that date, date well. Calendar. So does Stan Lurth <laughs> sitting out in the audience. Well, that that is what I'd like to do. I'd like to make a motion to postpone uh, this vote until the yeah, first people, council meeting, December first. Okay, know. it's been moved by Fairbanks and second by Party. <clears throat> excuse me, to postpone action on resolution number fifty-seven hundred four until the next council meeting. Now we can discuss the wisdom of postponing discussion, if you'd like, Bob. Does that cause any problems with what you guys have worked up at this point? I believe the numbers are solid. There's no, I mean, we don't have a deadline we're working up against as far as the quotes that we received. So okay. if, if that's, if you guys would like some more time um, to talk to us or whatever, that'd be, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. I, I did talk to a couple of Board of Public Works members and, and uh, they didn't really have a lot of discussion on it. They'd been working on it for so long that they really didn't have a lot of discussion, I guess. So. Okay. And I have no problem if you want to postpone it for a while. I don't think I, he's I'm not anything. saying that it's going to change my vote in two weeks, but I, it's just a lot of information to soak in in 45 minutes. So, and I, as like I said, during your presentation, I, I wrote down some questions and I, and I appreciate you know, you've answered them all well. I, I just, in in years past when something like this has happened, and I know Pat, you've done your work with like Liberal and, and Dodge City, but I've, I've usually emailed or called someone on their council and said, in the communities that we've used as comparisons, and I, I've called their public, you know, my counterpart in, in that community, or emailed them or called them and said, really, what do you think and before I've voted to spend this kind of money and I want that opportunity again. That's all. Okay. Uh, no other discussion. <laughs> you vote on postponement, please. 
And the motion carries 8-0. Okay. So we will we'll bring this back oh, December yeah. 1st. Uh, It'll be on your agenda. Yeah. If I may, if, there, if you do have questions, if you come up with other things between now and then, don't hesitate to let me know, and that way we can make sure we get you answers so you are fully informed and ready to make that decision. Yeah. It's just a lot of money. Okay, next up, uh, on reduced resolution number 5705, entering into an agreement with the Muscatine Lighting Company for lighting at Hannibal Park. Mayor, I move that resolution number 5705 be passed and adopted. Second. Moved by Cal and seconded by Claybaugh. That resolution 5705 be passed and adopted. I think we might need Mark and Pat. Mark and Pat, but Pat may have absconded already. No, he's there. He's there. He's there. Why don't you guys come up too, and <coughs> Tobias can start to kick off the kick off the uh, discussion. Sure. As you saw in your packet, uh, the lights out at Hannibal Park are the ones that we're looking at replacing. They were originally installed back in about 1978, and they're at the end of their useful life. 78 is what I've been told. You're right. I wasn't. I don't know. I don't remember them being put in. 83 because I designed them. Okay. I, I, I'm not arguing with you. I believe you. <laughs> But they're at the end of their useful life and need to be replaced. And what we originally budgeted for was to go out and replace the lights on one of the fields out there. And as we got going down and looking at what systems were available in, in the cost, Musco came to us and said they were proposing that they could do three of the fields, for, as you saw, for $310,000. They would finance over five years. But the biggest um, attribute there was that they would offer a 25-year warranty. So in 25 years, Pat's guys don't have to go out and touch the lights other than the change of fuse, which Musco will provide to us. Uh, they'll come out and they'll relamp them after a certain number of hours. If light bulbs burn out, they'll come down, they'll replace them, uh, and they'll take care of everything. And so when looking at it, knowing that we have to replace the other two fields, because they're also circa 1983, uh, that we need to replace those as well, we thought, why not look to do it all at once rather than tearing the field up three times over the next couple of years and when we can do it at one time we can do it cheaper this way and we also get the 25 years warranty with them so that's the proposal you have in front of you and these gentlemen can speak to the the details of what's out there and what's going to be done lay it on us well over the last probably four or five years we've had some issues with outages we've had um, bad wiring um, some ballast work that needs to be done. I know Pat's guys have been out there right before, oh, two years ago before district softball, um, redid a bunch of underground. Um, we had a transformer blow last year. Um, just seems like the last three or four years we've had issues upon issues upon issues. And so that's why we went to them. Oh, well, it's been, I think when Neil was here, we looked at doing it. And we started kind of the process looking into doing it. And now we're here and this is the 15 budget that we had a budget of 120,000 in Pat's budget and so Musco came to us and said well we're going to do one field that was like 135 and so they came up with the proposal to do all three for 317 somewhere around there um, so this is kind of where we're at <coughs> to you guys to do all three fields okay Rich um, do the ball team still pay a, a, a fee to use those lights and stuff no there is no fees um, but they do donate back to the facility. I mean, like the girls' softball two years ago gave us $12,000 for improvements. Um, every year they supply their own agri line. They do a lot of their own sprinkler repairs. Um, just they do a lot of maintenance out there, um, painting, just doing odds and ends. So <coughs> the five years that, that uh, th th that's a seven, uh, seventy-one thousand four hundred and eighty-eight. Excuse me, four hundred dollars and eighty-eight cents for five years. Uh, what's the interest they're going to charge us on that? Three point nine five. Three point nine five. That's all I got, dude. Okay, Ted. Pat. So each of the fields, they can still be, they still manual operated individually. You use one, you use one field more than the others. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you only needed one field that night right. and just needed to turn that one bank of lights on, yeah, yeah it, you just turn on what you need. Yeah, and, and okay, but what I'm saying is presently, Mark, you use one field more than, uh, not all. Oh, 
Field school. one's used more because of high school. He, he has and, the ability and, to, and to operate one field at a time right now. SEC plays on one in high school. That's just been the field that they've kind of used for the last. Okay. And just a little info, it, I know it was 83. I lived on Ella then as when and my wife and I moved back here 80, in 83 and before all the trees grew up. You Every time you turn the lights on, you could read in my house no matter what time. And yeah. I thought, my gosh, are they still playing softball at 1 in the morning? Actually, they so, were sitting yeah. out there drinking beer at 1 in the morning. But, you know. Well, I worked at the sheriff's office, and I couldn't afford beer. So, <laughs> But, yeah, I, but I, I, I guess I don't have um, – I don't have – as I read through this, I didn't have a lot of questions with it other than and, – and I understood that – I understood, Mark, that the, <coughs> that the team's – pay back you know a certain amount of money but improvements projects and the men's association to help with the concession stand and the structures and that kind of thing but i is there a cost savings to us i mean are these lights you know pat we put in the led lights you know on the street lights i mean are these a higher mm -hmm. is there any cost savings in using these lights do we are from they my, from my understanding that with the musco design there will be less lamps Per field, okay, with, and maintain the same light levels. Um, there are higher efficiency lights, um, so there will be energy savings. If, if, if I think I think they're going to accomplish that with higher poles because the poles that are there now are not the correct height. Right. So there was an overcompensation with fixtures to try and to try to alleviate that. try to alleviate that problem. So if the poles are higher, then yes, you can so get by with fewer so, fixtures. Right. So they will reduce the number of fixtures, which reduces the electric usage. Okay. I think that's all I have. Okay, Bob. Bob. I just have. I, I I think it's a good project, and I you know the softball fields, the baseball fields, they bring a lot of people to town. Oh yeah. So I think that's really really good. My question is more procedural, and since I'm still somewhat of a rookie, I can ask. I hope. Um, my question is, is this something that typically you do without an RFP, or was an RFP put out? I mean, I I don't know what what threshold. Do you need to? I mean, we've I'm, got some quotes around. Okay, I mean, okay. We, we did check around with some other companies to see what other systems were available. Um, and Musco, uh, we thought, provided the best both of price and quality. Okay. I'm just, where I work, yep. that's kind of, you know, if it's over $5,000, it's got to go out for the RFP. I was just trying to wrap my arms around that. Further council discussion about the audience, anyone? About back to the council? Okay, if there's no other discussion, you vote, please. Motion carries 8-0. Resolution 5705 has been passed and approved. Next, we'll have the public forum. The purpose of the public forum is for the presentation of an item <coughs> by the public to the city council for consideration at a later date. There'll be no discussion of these items uh, at this point in time. Uh, anyone in the audience like to present an item to the council by way of the public forum? Please come forward. Come on up. All right. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Lang. I'm the property owner next door to 407 Court Street, the historic Wadsworth building, um, which the roof collapsed uh, just last week. Or couple months ago but we learned about it just last week got a couple historic pictures of the building um, I'm mostly here as I know that uh, y'all can just pass them around um, uh, as we know that the building is likely uh, to be condemned um, and, and maybe taken down by the city I uh, just wanted to stress uh, my stance as a neighbor and a historic preservationist um, if it's at all possible to uh, at least maintain the facade of the building, I think that would be in our best interests uh, as a neighbor and with the community. Um, there are several concerns concerning um, uh, making sure that the neighboring buildings are structurally um, not affected uh, by this and pretty much that sort of thing. So. Well, just slightly echoing David's um, thoughts, obviously, um, this isn't something that you want to see every day, but looking at it, um, been very encouraged by just some of the very positive uh, conversations that have come out of it. A lot of people 
definitely wanting to see the historic um, integrity of, of this building preserved, if at all possible, mainly the, the front facade. Talking with the Nebraska State Historical Society, that was one of their suggestions was if it was possible. It would be nice to see that front facade saved. Um, I know there's been definitely several different um, possible projects that have been suggested for the, the property, and of course time will, will only tell. Um, but many of those definitely um, are enhanced by the, um, by the facade staying intact. And so um, just one of the parts of, of, of the suggestions that we have heard. Um, with efforts to uh, to designate the downtown as a historic district, this is one of the contributing properties. Uh, being a brick building from 1874, um, it may be the oldest brick building in downtown Beatrice. Our other buildings from the early 1870s are limestone. So. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. I'm Thanks, sure we'll gentlemen. Talk about it in the future. Yes. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to present an item to the council by way of the public forum? Okay, let's move along to the Beatrice Plus Committee report, and uh, who's going to present that? I can. Okay. Uh, as you see in your packet, the uh, Beatrice Plus uh, board met November 5th to discuss. They had three applications. Uh, one came from Keep Beatrice Beautiful for the uh, fifth and final piece of the um, energy stations that are along the bike trail that start down in Chautauqua Park. Uh, that application was for about $3,700. An application from the Girls Softball Association mm -hmm. for a scoreboard out at Hannibal Park and for some agri lime out at Hannibal Park. And as you see in the packet that the board voted to award the uh, scoreboard for $3,000 but not do the agri lime. Uh, that was something that could be done either at a later time or they were going to look for some other funding sources for that. And then the third application came from Main Street for a decorative wreath to go in Charles Park for about $425. If I remember correctly, there was one, one more wreath they needed to finish <coughs> out the there was one, additional <coughs> one additional pole put in and they needed an additional wreath for that pole. And so uh, you see that the board recommended approving that, that application as well. Uh, there are enough funds in Beatrice Plus to pay for all of the items that were approved. And if you recall now that the um, mechanism for Beatrice Plus, how that system works has changed. Uh, the dollar amounts rolling in, I believe in the first two weeks were almost equivalent to what had rolled in the previous fiscal year. So. Where, where did the funding come from the other, I, I know we, I, the other uh, exercise equipment, was that all, was some of that, was that Keno, was that general fund? Uh, it all came from us, didn't it? No. Um, one came from, I believe one came from Beatrice Plus, and I believe the other ones came from, she had acquired a grant through Lowell's. Lowe's, I think, yeah. 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 Norris Roundup and some of those, so they, she got some funding from some other sources. Okay. And this is, this is the last wreath you have? I mean, you're not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's. That there, there will end up getting all of the historic lighting that's there in Charles Park will now um, have those and they should last for quite some time. Yeah. Now, I, on a personal level, I don't have any problem with the, with these expenditures. My, my only concern is that these dollars seem to be being spent the way we used to spend Keno dollars. And I, I'd like to see the Keno dollars put back in there so we can use that, and these being more public funds, you know, instead of having, we have organizations that come in and attach these. I, you know, I would have liked to have seen, you know, the Arts Council or, you know, that type of thing ask for these funds, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to vote against it. And I think these are all worth, 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 worthwhile projects, so. Okay, well, let's start going down the line here with them, shall we, Petey? <coughs> I'm sorry. Let's start rolling, shall we? Okay. Mayor, I move that the application Beatrice plus funds from Keep Beatrice Beautiful for the purchase and installation of the last Play World Systems Energy Station number five in the amount of three thousand seven hundred and five dollars as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee be approved. Second. 
Moved by Catlin, seconded by Morgan, that the application for Beatrice Plus funds from Keep Beatrice Beautiful for the purchase and installation of the last Play World Systems, Play World Systems Energy Station Number no. Five, in the amount of three thousand seven hundred five dollars, as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee, be approved. Discussion on the motion. And any council discussion? Audience discussion? You vote, please. Motion carries 701. Next up. Mayor, I move that the application for Beatrice Plus funds from the Beatrice Girls Softball Association to purchase a scoreboard for Diamond Number no. 1 at Hannibal Park in the amount of $3,000, as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee, be approved. Second. Moved by Catlin, seconded by Cook, that the application for Beatrice Plus funds from the Beatrice Girls Softball Association to purchase a scoreboard for Diamond Number no. 1 in Hannibal Park in the amount of $3,000, as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee, be approved. Discussion from council members? Dwight? Are there any plans for advertising on it or sponsors or anything? Um, additional council discussion? Audience discussion. Can you vote, please. Motion carries eight zero. Next up, Mayor, I move that the application for Beatrice Plus funds from Main Street Beatrice to purchase a lighted decorative wreath for Charles Park in the amount of four hundred and twenty-five dollars, as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee, be approved. Second. Moved by Callan, seconded by Kerr, that the application for Beatrice Plus funds from Main Street Beatrice to purchase a lighted decorative, decorative wreath for Charles Park in the amount of $425 as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Committee be approved. Discussion? Dwight? A question for Michael. Will this be a matching wreath to all the rest of them or something different? It's the identical to, to everything else that we have. So, yeah. Further council discussion? They're beautiful. They look nice. Those ones downtown are ugly. Bauer picked them out and they're ugly. He's listening. They always have them. He's listening. I don't care. So if you like, they're we ugly. can look to budget some money next year for some Christmas decorations. There you go. <clears throat> further council discussion? Audience discussion? Can you vote, please? Motion carries 8 0. Uh, next up. We have an exciting discussion on Western Area Power Administration allocations on tap. That's right. It is an exciting uh, mm -hmm. discussion to be had here. As, as you all know, we get a portion of our energy allocation comes from WAPA, uh, Western Area Power Administration. And we receive that directly from them. MPBD then bills us some transmission charges. Well, MPBD joined the Southwest Power Pool here about five, six years ago, and MPPD is now saying that they can no longer bill us under two different transmission methods. Uh, we get billed under one method for all the energy we get from MPPD. We get billed under a different method for all the energy we get from WAPA. And MPPD is saying they can no longer do that. So what that means is we're going to have to amend some contracts between us and WAPA and us and MPPD. Now, there's some disagreement out there as to whether or not these actually need to take place. But MPVD is saying they have to, and so we will sort those things out. What you may see, though, coming down the line are contracts to amend and change uh, how we're billed on, on that transmission charges. Uh, if you see in your packet, what MPVD is proposing is that if we do what they're recommending we do, they think we can save about just a shy under $40,000 in a year. Uh, if we don't, and we keep going the other route, they think it costs us an additional $166,000 a year. And, and so there's still a lot of information to get, but we just want to kind of briefly update you, let you know that you may be seeing these contracts either come through on the Board of Public Works or ultimately to you guys. Yes, Rich? That, that WAPA, was that, that that other grid that we bought electricity off of years ago? No, it's, it's hydropower mostly, Gavin's Point, and okay. some okay. of the Pick Sloan projects. Yeah, we did away with that other grid from up north that we bought stuff 10, 15 years ago. You remember that? You might be that? referring to this. 
because we we've had this mix in our power probably power contracts since <coughs> probably the 30s when quite a few excuse years, me 50s yeah. when these things were built yeah didn't didn't in, in PPD try to get to us on this here a few years ago to to do away with it I'm, no we went, or am we, I not remembering that right we changed how we're built from MPBD. We used to be under what's called the blend station rate. We, we used to give them our application allocation. They blend it with theirs and, and bill us. Uh, we knew uh, going under their gen station rate, and we, we get billed directly from WAPA. Uh, they're telling me that that shouldn't change. It's just their transmission charges should change. Um, but again, we just want to kind of update you that you may be seeing some contracts come through here in the next. They want it done by the end of the year. I don't see that happening. so. Just to kind of give you an update. But we will still be using some of the WAPA stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, that will not change. Okay, questions, discussion? <coughs> any council members? How about in the audience, anyone? Okay, uh, city administrator's monthly report. I assume you have some highlights you'd like to go over? I do have a few highlights, but you know, I I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, one that I would note is 2407 Arapaho Trail was torn down uh, the last month, and so it was up there as the, one of the homes behind the old Kmart building, the Risky's building, that area. It was one of those that was re removed. Um, the police department just went through their testing. Uh, they'll have two job openings soon, and so uh, you'll saw that they did go through their process, through the civil service process of interviews and testing. and. Uh, you'll be seeing a uh, couple of new officers here shortly. Uh, the new structure for the skateboard park have arrived, but have not been installed yet. Uh, Mark is waiting for additional manpower and some weather changes so he can get out and get those installed. Uh, that's what you're doing that now. <laughs> yep, by the day after Christmas, they'll be ready. Yeah, you n they need to be. Yeah, yeah. their presents. For yeah. all those new skateboards? It's, it's we're, yeah, we drove by we're one time the day after Christmas. The light and I did, and those kids were sweeping the stuff off, doing those. Kid you not. So we'll, we'll get them out there. You also, one thing we talked about is painting the city auditorium. We keep the ashes beautiful. Did an excellent job of securing some grants for us to help pay for this. And so you'll see that that project should start here in the next couple of weeks uh, of painting the interior uh, of the city auditorium. Uh, one thing that we talked about the board is on our main one of our main water transmission lines that runs out to our well fields that are out by coke nitrogen it runs alongside the railroad tracks the big blue river has eaten into the railroad tracks it's gotten closer and closer well now all of a sudden burlington northern has decided this is a big issue and they need to move those tracks immediately which means we need to move our water line and some power poles and if any of you have dealt with a railroad in the past, you know they don't move quickly, but this time they decided they need to have this thing moved immediately. And so this was obviously not a budgeted item. Uh, we initially put a cost estimate of about $80,000 to move the water line alone. Um, with James and Steve, we've been able to work on that number. We think we can get it whittled down to about $50,000 of what it will cost for us to move it. Uh, the the railroad has talked to their contractor and they came in with a price of $250,000 to move it. And so I told them that either we'll move it or we'll pay you $50,000. We're not paying your contractor the additional 200,000. I'm waiting to hear back from the railroad as to whether they want us to do the work or they're gonna have their contractor do it and accept our contribution of 50,000, so. Are you talking to somebody in Fort Worth or are you talking to somebody in Lincoln? I am talking to somebody in California. And so we're, we're working through that one right now. In addition, uh, Pat's going to have some power poles. He's going to have to move as well. Uh, we are also securing the necessary easements that we need because currently we're on the railroad's right-of-way. They want us off of that. So we have to secure additional easements then to on the landowner's property to the south. And so we are working on that as well. What? What are they doing to stop the erosion? I mean, have you talked to... I don't know what their plans are. Uh, supposedly the... Because it seems to me like if this is a problem now, it's going to be a problem again in 15 years. It'll, it'll continue to be a problem there. It'll also be a problem about another 50 yards down the railroad tracks where it's also eating in another location. But the railroad didn't seem to care up until about three weeks ago. Yeah, you, 
Yeah. So. But on the plus side, uh, there probably was a time when the railroad <coughs> walked away from that line and said, forget it. They, right. they are going to do something about it, which. I thought you were going to say on the plus side, it's not going to happen until in December. No. <laughs> no. I, no. Not that, but no, that, I mean, sir, there's yeah. been serious no, discussion. Yeah, I, and I get that. A big problem, and that, that line could go away, so right. they're, they're willing to invest in useful. it, which is good. Yeah. Keep some rail service here. Uh, to update you on the welcome signs, uh, Carol Schuster is working on the welcome signs. She's working with uh, Radigan Schottler. They are donating some time to work out the design details and size and, and some of those things that they need to have done. Since Radigan is donating his time, you know, as, as we all know, those projects don't always move the fastest. Uh, but he is very grateful to do that. We are probably looking at sometime about May or June before design is finalized, uh, it's scaled, it, it's ready to roll out and start construction. You're probably looking at some time in that time frame. So just to update you on that one, I know that's one that's hanging out there. Um, i trying to think. Other than that, that was probably all the highlights that I had. Your code enforcement officer, is he going to get his own section in this eventually? Or is he always going to remain under the building inspection? Although I've read his little piece, I was, I'd be a lot more interested in what he's dealing with. We certainly can have him add more in there. Uh, the long-term plan is for him to grow into that building inspector position, right. and then he obviously would take over that whole section. Okay. Um, so, well, I, more information. Okay. Was your was the thing that they tore down on West Court um, at the corner in the 900 block West Court that they did last week? Was that on the list of stuff to be torn down? West Court Street. Oh yeah. West Court in the Fairgrounds Road. Somebody got a house up there, tore one down. Yeah. Uh, I think that was done by the private owner. Okay, that wasn't on your. That list. wasn't anything that we. Well, I, 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 and I knew it was private. Somebody else doing it, but I wondered if that was something that we nudged. I don't know that we encouraged them. I don't think so. Okay. Looks way better. I'm Do I, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm. Uh, I'm done. You met with Big Rivers in person. Yes, I met with Big Rivers in person. They were up here for a conference somewhere in the area and stopped by and I spoke with them. Um, they were up, they've obviously got a client up in Northeast Nebraska. Uh, they've talked to a few other municipalities on their way through. So yes, we are talking to a number of other possible wholesale providers. Speaking of your code enforcement officer, um, have them and our engineer been able to get into that uh, um, fire rents act house uh. on Ella Street mm -hmm. I believe they are currently oh. working on that one uh, I believe one of the hangers right now is is or is not the fire marshal still investigating or not investigating and I believe Mr. Butcher is working to resolve that issue uh, right now and I do apologize I was going to ask you about that Butch Friday when I was down there and I just forgot but uh that needs to come down. It's an eyesore, and it is also a uh, detriment to the uh, mm -hmm. to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Tobias? If not, uh, work session is next week here at seven o'clock, and regular council meeting is December first at seven. If there's no other business, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Here I move that the <coughs> meeting be adjourned at eight twenty-one p.m. Second. Moved by Catlin, seconded by Kerr to adjourn at 